Hello, and welcome to the screencast on using Monte Carlo simulations to generate confidence intervals, part two. So in the first screencast uh, where we did Monte Carlo simulations to generate confidence intervals, as we described, we left a few important things out. Um, we first uh, included had to include our uh, residual a variation residual standard errors and recognize that those are estimated and thus are subject to, to variation. But the thing we didn't really get to is how to include the idea that we will have covariation among our predictor variables. So I'm going to show a couple of ways to do deal with that. Um, sort of homemade solutions that I generally use, but also uh, some functions, one particular function that we used before, the sim function in the ARM package from the Gilman and Hill book. Um, I'm also going to just set up a few things. I haven't done this before, but I'm just going to set up a few things to make it a little bit clearer on screen. Just setting up a few options, and you can look at that on your own. And just like always, we're going to just read in some data and, and clean it up, and, and I'm not doing anything new here, so I'll let you, uh, you can read that on your own. Um, there's nothing new there, and we're going to center our covariate that we're working with, which is the tarsus length here, just as we've done before. Um, I do want to make one point um, that sometimes emitting data like we're doing here creates some weird variance of the object class that's going to be used, and it turns out that the predict function that we're going to use sometimes can cause uh, some weird warning uh, errors. So if you do get some errors when doing this, uh, not with this example, which should be error-free, but with your own data, it may be worth taking a look at whether the, the class of your object. So check both mode and class. Okay, and as before, we'll, we'll start by just plotting our simple linear model. Um, oops, well, that didn't work. I should probably actually capture all of the... Uh, there we go. So just as before, we're just going to look at the relationship between sex comb teeth and tarsus length, and I guess we're using centered tarsus length. And just like we've done before, I'm not going to go through this since I've described this uh, in one, if not two, previous screencasts, is how to generate the asymptotic normal confidence intervals on our estimates, which look like this. And what we're going to see now is that we can actually generate something fairly similar using Monte Carlo simulations which immediately people may ask, well, if we can already generate these with asymptotic normal, why do them? Well, because we'll be able to do this for, as we will discuss in class activities, we'll be able to do this for a much wider array of problems, including cases where the estimated effect size maybe doesn't have some nice, easy, closed form confidence interval to use. Okay. So one approach to it, approach that I actually generally use, um, although it's a little slower, but I like it a lot, is I'm actually going to, for the predictors I'm using, is I'm not going to simulate values of my predictor values. So I'm going to use the observed va values for my predictors. So in other words, you know, x1, x2, in this case our x's are just, we just have one, which is the tarsus length, but we can include tarsus and tibia and femur and the genotypic effects and what have you. Um, instead of simulating those components, we're really only going to simulate response vari uh, the response vector, um, and we'll use the actual observed data. And that allows us to keep the correlational structure among our predictors as a whole. This will only depend on the kinds of goals that you have. There may be cases where you do need to do predictions outside the range, uh, which of course has its own issues, but this sort of approach may not, may not work for that. So let's just take a look, quick look at the structure of this function, which is called simulation under model. Very much like we've seen before, there's a couple of arguments to the function the model that we have, so you could change that from DLL model to whatever model. Of course, the name of the covariate, otherwise it's simple. The first part here is just all the parts that we extract from that model, the coefficients that we're using, um, the residual standard error as before, and degrees of freedom as before. Really nothing new at all there. Uh, we could write this model in a more general format to, in fact, even extract our covariate, but it has not been done here. Um, and then we're going to run our simulation. And, and this is all like we've done before, really. We first do a simulation uh, of the residual standard error, just as we've done before. Once we have that, we're going to simulate our vector of response um, observations, uh, very much as we've done before. Keep in mind that our deterministic part of our model is going to be, because we're just doing a line, regression line, it's just going to be A plus B times the covariate, where A and B are just the intercept and slope, respectively and with the variation for these normally distributed va uh, values being determined by the residual squared error right here, just as before. And then we fit the linear model of the simulated response data to the observed covariate. So in this case, the, the uh, tarsus length is our observed covariate. 
And then we can take this simulation under model, just like we've done before. And we run it, and each time we do it, we're going to get an intercept and a slope. And again, these are simulated, and because I haven't kept perhaps as many digits as I can, it looks like uh, at least the intercept's not changing, but it is under the hood. We could change the number of digits we're using. It is still storing them. It's just not printing them all out. Um, but of course, that's not very useful to us. So instead, what we're going to do is do a 1,000 simulations of this we're using the replicate function. And then uh, from that, we can, as we've done before, generate confidence intervals uh, and what have you. So first, we can quickly compare the simulated confidence intervals for the slope, which go from about 23.0 to 30.9 to the confidence and the asymptotic normal confidence intervals, which is from 23.0 to 30.8. So they're actually giving you surprisingly similar uh, results, or actually not surprisingly, I would say in this case, uh, we have a lot of data. So again, showing sort of that for this particular case, the assumptions of normality that we are making for our response are actually holding, despite the fact that these are discrete values. Um, we can take this and then actually plot um, the values back onto our um, our plot here, and these are these thin um, gray lines here, and you can see that they they pretty much perfectly overlap with our our asymptotic normal confidence intervals for the confidence band, so that's great. Uh, I won't go through it here, but you could look at the the distributions of those simulated values and, and compare them to the observed if you if you wish. Hopefully, that's uh, that will give you pretty much the same information we just looked at, though, just a different way of looking at it. Um, what I do want to make a point of is taking a look. Uh, at the covariance between parameter, par parameter estimates. So we've often looked at using the VCO function as how our parameter estimates covary. Well, our simulation provides a very nice way to do that. So we can really ask, what is the correlation between each simulated intercept and the simulated slope that was done under the same iteration? Uh, so one way of thinking about that is just doing a, a plot. And what essentially we see here is that for a given iteration, there's actually very, or across all iterations, I should say, there's very little relationship between the simulated slopes and simulated intercepts. Uh, and we could look at that numerically by looking at the covariation among the simulated coefficients versus the, the covariance for the variance covariance matrix, and you see they're quite similar. I think it's perhaps easier to see it by looking graphically in the car package um, and seeing that, in fact, the ellipse that is drawn here is remarkably similar to sort of the space, the sample space, or the estimation space that's covered under our simulation. And if you look at the, the range of values, it's quite similar here. They're, in fact, showing, uh, I think, very similar axes. Um, in fact, I didn't specify that, so that just gives you a good idea of, of what's going on. Um, so that's one approach to doing such a simulation, really accounting for the additional variation, explicitly use those the observed covariates. But sometimes there's other things you may want to do. So one approach is to, instead of simulating response vector itself, you actually just do your simulations under the uh, of the parameters themselves, including the structure of the covariances among the estimated parameters. So for this, to do this, what we're going to have to do is use the mass library. And it's going to be important to note that this is a little bit different than the simulations we've done up to now. We're not going to simulate a vector of response of, of observations of the response variable. We are literally going to just simulate slopes and intercepts. The way we're going to account for, for the covariation is to literally say, let's use the estimated covariances from the parameter estimate. So in other words, the numbers we get out of the VCO function. So to do this, we're going to have to use a function from the mass library, which is installed by default, um, which allows us to simulate under multivariate normal. And we've got to know how many observations we need to simulate. So we're going to just make little n be the number of rows or number of observations we have in this data set. And like I said, here we're generating random intercepts and slope for the observed model. And then we're going to plot curves, as we've done before. But we're not simulating the response and refitting, but just simulating from the distributions of slopes and intercepts instead, having accounted for the degree of covariation. And so this function is actually quite simple. This model sim uh, function, in fact, it's only got one argument here uh, that you need to worry about, the dll.model. Um, so we're just calling that model. And what we're using is the multivariate normal um, distribution. So this is going to produce random numbers out of a multivariate normal. We're just asking each time for a single number, n equals 1. And there's sort of two main pieces to this, two main sort of arguments to this function that we were thinking about. One is the vector of means. 
And our vector of means in this case is just going to be our coefficient. So if we had a model with just an intercept and slope, we just have a vector with two means. One is the intercept, one is the slope. If we have 10 coefficients, we're going to have a vector of length 10, again, for each of those coefficients. And so we literally can just specify coefficient 1 through coefficient however many p, you know, up to p, p parameters that we're estimating. In this case, it just happens to be 2, and we can just write it this way. The other thing that we need to specify is the variance-covariance structure of this multivariate normal. But thankfully, all we need to do is give it the variance-covariance um, of the actual model. So we fit the model up here, and we said, okay, use the fit model. And then we use that structure. And that's going to allow us to account for the covariation among parameters. It's making strong assumptions, of course. We're making strong assumptions of multivariate normality. So we're, in fact, making somewhat stronger assumptions than we even did in the simulation above. Um, where if the uh, correlative structure between predictors was not multivariate normal, that would be accounted for. Here we're making that, that assumption. And then we're just returning uh, from, from this the um, simulated slope and, and, and simulated intercept. So we can run that. And we can just run it once like we've done before. And each time we do it, just like we've done before, we've written this this way on purpose, we just get intercept and slopes. And you can see the numbers are pretty similar. Similar, But let's actually do the simulation many times. It's quite quick because, in fact, the, the, we're not actually having to simulate nearly as many numbers. But we can compare here the confidence intervals that we've gotten uh, in this first case from, from this simulations directly simulating slope and intercept below the ones we simulated, uh, the first set of simulations we did in the screencast, where we actually simulated the response vector itself, but you see that these confidence intervals are pretty similar. And then, of course, at the bottom, the asymptotic normal confidence intervals, again, on the slope. And they're all very, very similar. So in this particular case, even though we're making these additional assumptions of multivariate normality among uh, the parameters, it still seems to be uh, reasonably, uh, we be getting very similar estimates. That may not always be the case, and so you want to be careful if you don't think that uh, making those assumptions of multivariate normality among your parameters is reasonable. Probably this approach would not work, and the one we discussed above is, is a better one to use. Okay, and of course we can just do plots like we did before. Um, so I'm just going to plot the, the, the simulated uh, values and the confidence intervals on as before, and here we are getting very similar results. It seems to be uh, very consistent. Finally, um, just like we did in the first screencast uh, for Monte Carlo confidence interval, we can use the sim function in the ARM library, so you need to call ARM. Um, you'll get a few more things, mine's already um, been called. And we just need to call the sim function with the name of our model and how many simulations we want to do. From that, we extract the simulated slopes. Please notice the ampersand here instead of the dollar sign. That's because these are stored in a slightly different class uh, of object called an S4 class. Most of the ones we use are S3, but you just need to keep in track when you have to use the ampersand versus the dollar sign. Um, so you just will just run these, and then we can just get the uh, confidence intervals just as we did before, and we can see that our confidence intervals from, from the ARM package, from SIM in the ARM package, 22.9 to 31.0, it's very close to our 23.0 to 30.8. Again, getting very consistent results. And similarly, we can just do the plot again. I don't think that's necessary to look identical. And these are sort of, so the SIM package is, is really just using an approach very similar to this one where we uh, assumed a multivariate normal distribution uh, for our, our responses, at least as I understand it. Um, but it allows for a lot more uh, variables, so depending on the object you put in, it actually allows for a lot more variable structures, and we'll talk more about those later on in this class. Um, but do keep in mind, if you think that such assumptions of multivariate normality are not as good, then perhaps using the observed predictors is a, a better way. And if you really want to feel uncomfortable making any such assumptions, then resampling methods perhaps would be preferred, non-parametric resampling methods. Um, and thank you, and that's the end of this uh, screencast.